Welcome back to The Dive. Quebec announced payments of $500 each to residents to counter the rising cost of living. And our guest today will share his thoughts on actions fighting inflation. He'll touch on the stagflation to recession arguments, uranium prices, gold, and oil. He's the principal analyst and editor of independentspeculator.com and one of our regulars here at The Dive, Lobo Tigre is joining us today. But before we bring you Lobo's interview, do me one quick favor and go ahead and just smack that subscribe button, please. Hey Lobo, welcome back to The Dive. Happy to be back with you in the audience, Cassandra. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us again today. Okay, so last week, Quebec announced a one-time payment of $500 to its residents to counter the rising cost of living. This is ahead of a fall election in the province, which includes them running a projected $6.5 billion budget deficit for fiscal 2023. California is talking about similar moves. We have to ask, what are your thoughts towards these actions to fight inflation? It's become almost cliche to talk about putting out the inflation fire with gasoline, but that's exactly what they're doing. They, they're proposing to fight inflation with inflation. That is literally what's happening. Um, and it's it's not just the left coast or or <laughs> I mean, there's a dozen states right now that are talking about sending stimmy checks to their their dear residents who know no fault of their own or suffering high inflation. But you know, it's still, it's fighting inflation with more money printing, the root cause of inflation. So it, it is crazy and it is scary. This can't end well. They are, um, you know, you, you think of hyperinflation as being something that happens in some banana republic somewhere. But if high inflation spins out of control, if you fight inflation with more inflation, who knows? I mean, it, we could see things that we would never have thought happened in the first world come home to roost. Uh, so uh, what's the takeaway, Cassandra? I, you know, I, I'm just waxing rhapsodic here. But the takeaway is I do think we're going to see higher inflation. I think that the base effects that would have maybe moderated inflation, that, that doesn't help us if they just throw more money at the problem. So High inflation to stick around for a long time is, is the least of our worries, I think, but it could get higher and it could spin out of control. So you want real assets the government can't print on your side. Now, despite Fed Chair Powell's tough talk on inflation, glancing at the media, we're seeing arguments ranging from stagflation to recession. Do you see an economic downturn on the horizon? Yeah, I've been in the stagflation camp for well over a year now, uh, though back then it was because I thought the knock on effects from all the COVID shutdowns would have negative economic consequences. I think that's played out pretty well. But now on top of this, we have a war, which <laughs> you know, war is the health of the state, but it sucks for the economy. Stuff gets destroyed. And you might say, oh, well, it's just stuff in Ukraine. So that's too bad for the Ukrainians. But no, it as we have just been shown so graphically by the COVID-19 shutdowns in, in a globalized world, destruction anywhere damages the entire whole and supply chains get broken. You know, this all the, <laughs> never mind Russia's energy. Well, no, not never mind it. Mind it, it's really important, but we also have all the food that comes from Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, the, this is a, this alone is a huge topic. I don't know how deep we want to get into, but, I, I'm in the stagflation camp, and that could be just weak growth or an actual recession with high inflation, or if things spin out of control, as we were saying before, it could be depressionary inflation, which would be really something to see in the first world, uh, the so-called first world. You know, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm not going to tell you, you know, which case it will be. I do think that the very least, though, you know, anybody. Uh, who sees what's coming should be preparing themselves, should harden their portfolios. Of course, I like physical bullion, gold and silver, my direct possession as the hardest of assets. Uh, but there are related equities that one can use to try to make some gains, maybe offset the losses that 
unfortunately seem to be headed our way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people I've been talking to are definitely sharing that same sentiment. Okay, so shifting gears here, the UK government is planning to get 25% of its electricity from nuclear power. Nuclear power sent sentiment is clearly changing before our eyes. Do you think that this has an overall effect on uranium prices near term? Where do you see uranium prices heading from here? As much as I'm a uranium bull, actually, I, you know, logically, it should have no effect whatsoever on near term uranium prices. You're going to have a new initiative. We're going to get a quarter of our energy from nuclear power. Great. You got to start making plans. You got to have things approved. You have to raise the money and really start building. You know, this is something that decades down the road makes a big difference in the UK. Uh, fortunately, though, that's not all that's going on. We already have the BRICS countries building nuclear power plants, you know, left and right. China alone has plans for 150 or more. I mean, this is a this is a trend that's already going on. It's a trend that had demand far outstripping supply before. Uh, the war reminded those in the West that, oh, you know, maybe we should have some other form of energy available, let alone, you know, not carbon emitting energy, which is a whole nother part. You didn't ask, but, you know, the whole green agenda. It's amazing to me how the world is fighting a war. We're going into a new Cold War scenario and the powers that be in the West are doubling down on the green agenda. Like we can afford to... <laughs> We can afford to not just get rid of Russian energy, but replace it with green energy. Um, that strikes me as very ambitious, and there's no way they can do that without nuclear. So I, I think that the bellwether to watch for here is if Germany does a U-turn. That would really, I think, be the icing on the cake. But even without this, the world was going in this direction anyway, so I'm a uranium bull anyway, and, and uh, you know, prices still have a lot way higher to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on to talk about metals here. The London Metal Exchange has no current plan to ban metals from Russian producers, despite calls from some members to do so. How closely are you watching the development of Russian commodity export markets? I think, well, as close as I can, and this is very important. Obviously, you know, we live in a global economy. We depend on Russia for energy, whether we like it or not. We get most of our, our titanium, believe it or not, from Russia. We get a large part of our palladium, which goes in our pollution control devices. You know, it's a global economy where all these things are necessary and large, uh, a large amount of them come from Russia. So you cut Russia off, you hurt yourself. And there are a lot of carve outs. There's a lot of exemptions for energy. And, you know, maybe that changes but you want to try to do it in a measured way. But that's if you're in government and you're trying to secure votes and make sure you don't piss off voters by making their life more expensive while you beat up the bad guys. Um, but, but the narrative is, I wouldn't say it's totally out of control yet, but it is clearly not entirely in their control. You've got dock workers refusing to offload Russian crew and you've got companies self-sanctioning, removing themselves, refusing to, you know, McDonald's and Coca-Cola shutting down in Russia, but also people say, no, we're not going to buy uh, Russian commodities anymore. There was a mine, I forget which one it was. I just saw a headline this morning about one mining company saying we've resourced and we're not taking any more uh, of this metal, whatever it was from Russia. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting on the details, but that, this did happen this morning. So it, it is happening, Cassandra, whatever the LME decides. So you know, they, they may or may not have a choice. As far as the LME goes, I think that the bigger question is how does the volatility affect them? The whole debacle that we saw with nickel and not trading for more than a week, and then they open it up and the market breaks again, and then they open it up and the market breaks again, and now it's going up, you know, it's stopping out on the upside. This kind of volatility, I think, is something that I think will stick with us for at least the duration of the war, and at least until uh, you know, there's no more new rounds of sanctions. The, the sanctions settle in into whatever the new Cold War is, however the new Iron Curtain gets set up. You know, we'll see how things stabilize after that. Um, however they stabilize, Cassandra, things will be more expensive, less efficient. The new Iron Curtain is not a good thing for the global economy. And until then, you know, buckle up. We're, we're headed for a lot more volatility. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the so-called rupee-ruble trade mechanism lets Indian exporters continue their business with Russia, even after Western sanctions restricted international payment mechanisms. How do you think this affects the overall sentiment towards gold? Well, first, let's look at the at the currency part separately, because this is really important and it's part of a larger trend. You've also got uh, China in negotiations with Saudi Arabia to pay directly in Yuan and India coming back to India. They're also looking to do that. They have a lot of trade with China. They've got Yuan too. They, you know, the world is uh, on notice from the powers that be in the West that their reserves in dollars and euros can be frozen. I, I think you know the the there, the consequences of what everybody just saw happen to Russian assets has to have central bankers and really anybody around the world wondering how how exposed do we want to be to dollars and euros if if we do something that those guys over there think is unpopular and suddenly they freeze us out. So there's a potential for currency regime change here on the reserve currency status of the dollar. I think that's the bigger question, and the ruble rupee uh, trade is just part of that but very telling straw in the wind and, and of course of course india is going to try to find cheaper raw materials if it can they, they got a you know a huge population to feed this is not just something of tightening your belt and we'll be okay and of course china is similarly going to you know so i think these things are are <laughs> unavoidable i mean that's the path we're going down and it, it, uh, it changes the whole question of the dollar's reserve currency status. And so back to gold, your question for gold. I know there's a thesis out there that the world is now going to adopt gold instead as a neutral reserve currency asset. I get the logic of that, but uh, politicians are not always logical. Markets are not always logical. I, I think the powers that be will resist going to a new gold standard for as long as possible. I think things will break. I think we'll have major uh, disruptions before they're willing to go there. So I, I just, I don't see a smooth, logical transition to a, a better mousetrap in this place. I'm, I'm sorry to say. But meanwhile, we, even without all that, you know, people are looking at these funny little green and other colored pieces of paper that we thought had so much value and questioning that value that has to be good for real money, uh, gold and silver. Yeah, you would think. Okay, so let's move on and talk about oil. This morning, Saudi Aramco reportedly saw one of its facilities hit with a rocket from rebels in the area. How do you account for the continued geopolitical risks in Europe and the Middle East when looking at the oil markets? Uh, account for it or what, what do we do about it? I mean, if there, there are there are hostilities there that have been going on for years. I don't make too much of this rocket attack. We've had rocket attacks. You know, we have several of them every year. A couple of years ago, there was four, I think, rocket attacks in one day or one weekend or something. It was, it was seen like an escalation that was quite alarming, but then it settled down again. Um, I'm not saying the Middle East will never go up in flames. All I'm saying is it's been on the edge of flames for decades. So, uh, you know, it's a little difficult to hold your breath too long when you're waiting for something that, that keeps being on the verge of happening for so long. Uh, that said, uh, the, the instability there never helps. And if you've got OPEC plus and suddenly the plus goes away because of the sanctions on Russia, I mean, the, at the same time, you've got Biden over there now really pushing the Europeans hard to stop importing oil and gas from Russia, particularly the gas, which you, you know, a week ago, that seemed like a non-starter of a conversation. They, they can't just turn off those pipes. They need it too much. But that conversation is actually happening right now. This, this, the whole, the geopolitics is rearranging the whole energy distribution uh, paradigm around the world. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen overnight because that will be very disorderly and a lot of people will get hurt, but it's happening. And it's sort of with my new Iron Curtain thesis, however it works out, whatever pathways these happen to take, the end result is less efficiency in the global economy, higher prices. Mm -hmm. Now, what are your thoughts on Russia trying to only accept payment in rubles for natural gas from unfriendly nations? 
is very clever. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure why nobody saw this coming. I didn't really think of it. I, I can't say, oh, I saw this coming. I should have listened to me. I, I think it's kind of funny. It, it's sad to find funny things in the midst of such a, a tragic uh, you know, global event. And I'm not just being politically correct in saying that. I've got friends and family directly involved in the area of conflict. So this is very personal to me. It is tragic. Um, but <laughs> what are you going to do, hide in the hole? So it you know, makes perfect sense to me that Putin would turn around and say, okay, sanction me. Well, you know, uh, in terms of practical implications, it's not as big a deal, I think, as it seems. You know, a bank can exchange euros or dollars for rubles and then pay for things with that. But I think that it's more than symbolic. I think it does create a use case for rubles. And it fits with what we were saying earlier about the threats to the reserve currency of the world status of the dollar. The, you know, one of the main uh, pillars that rests on is the petrodollar system, which you've got Saudi Arabia and China threatening, you've got India threatening, and if the ruble now has a use case as money you need to pay for oil in, that's a very direct threat to the petrodollar system. So interesting times, interesting developments. We'll see how the West responds. You know, they have, they have contracts in Europe to pay for their gas in dollars and euros. So I, you know, most of the experts I've seen chime in on this think that Europe's going to try to insist on abiding by those contracts. I, I think it's uh, highly doubtful that, that Putin cares about the details of those contracts, you know, and, and he's got the gas. So we'll see what happens. At the, at the very least though, this is yet another attack on the petrodollar and the US dollars reserve currency, of, you know, the world's status. And that's very significant, uh, not just for gold bugs and silver bugs, but for the entire global economy. Mm -hmm, definitely. Okay, well, that's all I have for you today, Lobo. Thank you so much for coming on. Would you like to uh, share where our audience can grab more of your commentary before you go? Sure, I'd just like to encourage everybody to sign up for our free weekly letter. If you do, you don't get spammed with, you know, dozens of advertisements flooding your inbox every day. You get one email once a week, show you something of what I can do for you and, you know, maybe we'll do business, but if not, please enjoy the free letter. Perfect, thanks, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Cassandra. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll be back again tomorrow with the latest news and updates. But in the meantime, why don't you like, subscribe, and share?